welcome back. This is our next 10 minutes his 10 minute history. Sorry. Last time we talked about Hegesippus, who was a chronicler shortly after the time of the apostles and during the times of Polycarp of Smyrna and Ignatius of Antioch that provided a possible glimpse at the death of James, the brother of Christ, and the growth of the church of Jerusalem in the wake of his death. To learn more about him, check out that video, okay? And then today, though, we are looking into an interesting character in church history who has often been considered the first antipope. His name is Hippolytus of Rome. Hippolytus was born around 170 CE and died in 235 CE. He was a leader in the church during the bishopric of Zephyrinus of Rome, roughly 199 CE to 217 CE, and during that time had clashes with a man named Calixtus, who held modalist tendencies. Modalists believed that God was the only one person who just, uh, sorry, was only one person who just changed titles when he was acting as either the Father, Son, or Holy Spirit which Tertullian had already confronted in the West as being an inadequate description for the nature of the Godhead. It is unclear whether Hippolytus had read Tertullian's works since Tertullian was not recognized by the Church very much at the time. However, Irenaeus of Lyon, who we already talked about as well, held the same belief as Tertullian regarding the three persons, one substance model, of the Trinity. And there has been a past tradition stating that Hippolytus could have been a disciple of Irenaeus, though that has not been confirmed. Regardless, his staunch defense of the three persons, one substance model brought him into conflict with both Zephyrinus and Calixtus. And when Calixtus took over the seat of Rome in 217, things got worse between them because Calixtus began to take measures to extend absolution toward graver sins such as adultery without requiring repentance for those sins. Hippolytus was so distraught by this that he split from the larger church and began a separate unaffiliated church that he led through the, led through the seats of Calixtus, Urban I, and Pontian, which was roughly a span of 217 to 235 CE. His church held strongly to Tertullian's views of the Trinity and upheld the ethical standards of the apostles and the early church fathers who had preceded him. As a side note, Origen later picked up Hippolytus' arguments against Calixtus and continued writing against them after hearing Hippolytus preach. So Hippolytus had some influence on the life and the theology of Origen, though not as much as Clement of Alexandria. Hippolytus' writings are important for the church even now, and there are many of them. For the sake of time, we will focus on one of his writings because he was one of the most prolific writers of the faith. He wrote on a large variety of topics, from exegesis to apologetics. But his most important writing that was discovered and published in 1851 has been titled Philosophumina. It is an expansive refutation of heresies during his time, especially the heresies of Calixtus, and he makes many arguments that are important to anyone growing in the faith. The writing is too long for us to cover it all and actually consists of 10 volumes. So we will be focusing only on his sixth work, which actually continues some of the work that he did in his fourth work, where he tackles a faulty viewpoint from a man named Simon Magus. Magus was postulating a form of panentheism, God is nature, that is strange and concerning. He said that there are six powers that make up the world, mind, intelligence, voice, name, ratiocination, or known, also known as reasoned thought, and reflection. And he asserted that each is represented by heaven, earth, sun, moon, air, and water in that order. Outside of that emanation is a seventh power that is both within them and outside of them so that he can be formed into images that accord with his nature. But if he does not get formed into an image, then he will vanish from existence. Magus acquired this idea from Moses and the burning bush in Exodus, describing the seventh power, God, as the fire around the bush flickering in and out of existence. 
He then equated the seven days of creation to the seven powers, arguing that when the universe was made, it was actually the six powers that were being formed and then immersed and enveloped by the seventh. Accordingly, when Genesis speaks of the, of the Spirit of God hovering over the waters, Magus argued that this is the penultimate form of the infinite reducing chaos into order. And when order is then achieved, it makes man in its twofold image being both spirit and material, representing the fluctuation of the infinite in and out of existence. Magus then asserted that whenever a human focuses and becomes completely spiritual, he will achieve true greatness by no longer being a generated entity and attain the eternal status of God. These ideas are heavily Gnostic, but they are specifically so, and the way that Hippolytus handles them is important. He takes a tactic that was not, a pre that was not as prevalent during his time. He traces the arguments of Magus to the teachings of many early Greek thinkers in order to show that they are not biblical ideas. In particular, he finds the comparison of the infinite being and the elements to be reminiscent of Empedocles' argument that everything can only be known by itself, i.e. fire by fire, water by water, earth by earth, and so on. This is interesting because if Hippolytus is right, then Magus has taken Empedocles way out of context by saying that all of these are individual interlocking powers that are connected to the divine being and are capable of being divine in and of themselves, which is not biblical and or in accords with Empedocles either. Empedocles was actually suggesting that each element is individual and cannot fully explain the other elements, only themselves. But that is not all. Hippolytus also goes on to explain how Magus combined the gospel accounts with the Iliad, calling Helen of Troy the lost sheep, whom Magus claimed to have rescued and claimed for himself. He thought that all powers of creation resided in her and that is what result resulted in the war over her, and then he claimed that he had found her in Tyre, and that he was the seventh power made manifest in the midst of the people. So he was claiming himself to be essentially a messiah figure. Hippolytus rightly calls all of this fictitious, not just because it is outlandish and absurd, but because Magus is making historical claims based on Greek accounts that are known to be fictitious. And his arguments then influenced many of his followers to enslave in improper, sec enslave in improper sexual exploits, uh, thinking that the powers of creation thrive in all women, and it was their duty to take hold of that power and, and knowledge in order to become unbridled souls. There is much more to the writing, and it is difficult to keep up with at points. Magus is not Hippolytus's only target either, but Hippolytus gives us a valuable tool for critiquing, critiquing what others are thinking, the tool of reference and correlation, which is still used in argumentation today on all sorts of fronts. He stuck to his guns so much that he remained detached from the church at large for the rest of his life until the persecution under Emperor Maximinus Thrax. He was exiled along with Pontian, Bishop of Rome, to Sardinia in 235 CE, where he was sentenced to hard labor in the mines. It was there that he died from the hazards that came with the operation but it is alleged that he became reconciled to the church before his death. In the Eastern Orthodox Church, he is still recognized as a saint. Thank you as always for tuning in. It is always a pleasure to bring you the depths of theology and help you understand Christ and his church. Have a blessed Father's Day weekend and share this video with many more people so we can continue to teach them about theology and about Jesus. I love you all. And you all have a blessed week, grace and peace.